Welcome to part two of Tyson's Scorecard. No introductions really needed. We covered part one already last week, so go and check that out if you haven't already. But coming up in part two, we delve deeper into this D2C scorecard in the attempt to understand if this is a silver bullet for all D2C eight and nine figure merchants to use to operate their database decisions. Let's find out. Over to you, Tyson. Brought to you by Senlane and Rewind. So then we've got marketing spend here. Pretty self-explanatory. This is just the aggregate of all marketing spend. Um, you know, Facebook, Google, you can include like influencer marketing there. You can include affiliate commissions there, you know, TikTok. Um, different brands I've worked with defined, define what they include as marketing spend differently. Some people include cost of um, external agency, creative assets in there. Um, some people don't. So, so, so it just allows for some flexibility. Um, you know, CAC, you know, um, um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, um, you can view it as AMER or CAC. Um, it's just CAC here just because it's an example dashboard. Um, marketing efficiency ratio, I, I like to view it as a percentage. So um, cost, uh, marketing cost, marketing spend divided by net sales. In this example, I just like to view it as a, as a percentage because that's how it's viewed on the P&L. Um, uh, it's viewed as what is mar what total marketing as a percentage of um, net sales. So I just like to I like to view it as that personally. Um, some people like to view it differently. Um, uh, and then we just have, um, and so, so, so here we've talked about, um, you know, the funnel sessions to add to cart to check out the conversion rate, you know, how much do they order? What's the add to cart? What's the average quantity? Just some information about the order. What, what's the, what's the revenue mix, new customer revenue to, to existing customer net sales, you know, how much we spend to like get this, get this net sales and, and revenue, uh, AOV, um, uh, you know, a bit about the marketing, you know, how, how, how much did it cost to get the customer purchase and what was the MER. And then we, it just runs like a typical P&L, right? So you just go your gross sales, you know, minus discounts. Some people like to um, have returns as an extra column here. Um, it, it, we can integrate it or, or not. It's just um, it's just not viewed here just to keep keep it limited number of columns. So discounts, I, I, like, to, I like to monitor discounts because um, maybe there's a sneaky discount that's coming through um that that you know is being picked up by some third party discount software or maybe someone entered in a discount coupon wrong and if this if, you know if, if you're running five percent here just about every day and all of a sudden it drops up to like seven or ten boom flag oh what's going on here okay discount is higher than usual you know you can diagnose the issue fix it right away fast feedback loop and so then you got your net sales um you know gross profit and it's just like a typical PL gross profit gross margin Contribution margin, which those of you who don't know is is um, gross profit um, minus cost of delivery, um, which is uh, cogs. Uh, um, so sorry, that that's what gross profit is. Contribution margin is um, um, let me start again. Contribution margin is, is gross profit minus marketing spend. Um, so you just take this column minus this column uh, equals contribution margin, and then what you want to do is you want to ensure that your contribution margin is greater. Um, it basically covers your, your, your OPEX. So what's OPEX is cost of people, cost of rent, software um, is included in OPEX. Some, some people include um, you know, you know, merchant fees uh, as part of their OPEX. Um, and, and that's one of the differences between like what a, what a, you know, a P&L versus uh, like what Shopify does. Um, and I can, I can get into more details of that, but that's basically like, like, like a funnel. Um, Just a quick question on that yeah. one then. That, that, that's blended new customers and retained customers, right? Rolled up into that uh, contribution margin at the end? Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. So, so yeah, it, it, exactly. Right. So this is blended. So, you know, this can be broken out into, it's, it, it's a bit harder to break this out into new customer contribution margin versus existing customer contribution margin. Because to do that effectively, you also need to break marketing spend out into new customer, exclusively new customer marketing spend and existing customer marketing spend. And the problem with that is, is um, it, it, it's really difficult um, to do that because of, of you know, the, the loss in data transparency and targeting that due to iOS 14, um, but not every, um, and, and this is one of the things that I don't like about actually the, the, the CAC calculation um, or the AMER calculation. So AMER being like market, all the marketing spend divided by only um, new customer net sales. And that's stupid because the assumption there is that not, 
you know, we're not spending any money on returning customers. But that that's ridiculous because, um, you know, if, if that were true, you'd be able to, you'd, on Facebook, you'd be able to do all the exclusions for um, all the um, campaigns uh, to only target new customers. And of course, that's not correct. You can exclude, you know, you can do your, your 180 day exclusion, you know, page view, add to cart, um, you know, retargeting, you can do your club, you know, customer or exclusions. Um, but as we all know, you, you still get a percentage of um, uh, returning customers based upon that marketing spend. And so, um, so, 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 so you could do like a, a dirty, like, um, you know, hands in the sky, like, all right, this is good enough and go like, okay, so like new customer, spend you know new customer net sales is like 89 percent returning customer net sales is like 10 percent maybe our marketing spend is probably similar um so maybe you could just do a contribution margin calculation on that to get um new to, to like break out new customer contribution versus existing customer contribution um yeah that, that's I how i that's how i might approach it's a lot harder now due to the um due to due to the difficulty of targeting how do you how does that um how does that work for people at the moment in terms of um i think most of the community is focused on profitability and yep. uh that makes sense for the time we're in and so how does that how do you roll this up into profitability if your contribution you're taking opex outside of contribution margin so do you do another calculation now at the end of this to say right yeah. now we've got to take opex out where do we land yeah exactly right and so um uh, I have uh, I didn't include it here, but you know, usually clients that I work with, um, and, and I push for this as well, uh, like to include like a net, uh, like a net profit column here at the end after after this column. I didn't talk about the others. So so you have like contribution margin, percentage of contribution margin, which is like what is like the contribution margin a percentage of net sales. Uh, you know, some some clients are like, okay, well, we need to stay above thirty percent hypothetically. So as long as we're staying above thirty percent and we're scaling, um, and MER is in a certain range, like we're good to like keep spending um, uh, more money. Um, and then your contribution margin per order is basically you know contribution margin divided by orders, and that's like how pro how much how much contribution margin are we making per order. And you know, are we are we increasing or are we are we are we decreasing that over time as well? You should be increasing um, contribution margin per order, and also um, you know, scaling your 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 um, net sales as well. Ideally, um, that's that's the best case scenario. But to answer your question, um, so we had another column that just says um, either uh, percentage uh, net profit, um, and then I know some you know some founders are working like, okay, well we want like a 15% net profit. And so th then what we do is like, we, we then m like work backwards and then go like, okay, so if you want like a 15% net profit, that means, you know, given what your OPEX cost is, you know, for those who don't know, OPEX doesn't fluctuate too, too much, uh, unless you go on a big hiring spree, like, pr like last week, or unless you have some crazy rent costs that might follow through. Do, OPEX you, include, is pretty do you include agency Sorry, fees in your OPEX? Um, it, it depends. It's always, it depends. Um, I would include agency fees as I, I prefer to include, um, agency fees as part of like, um, marketing, um, but break it out into like its own like line. So there's like, there's like platform spend and then there's like other fees. So, so an, an example would be a creative agency. Um, and, and then you include that into, into marketing, um, it, uh, only because um, like that's what you're paying for like uh, like your creative assets, right? So therefore it should be included as part of the marketing line item, not in the people in my view, but you know, different accounting standards uh, are different. Australia's got a different accounting standard to the US, maybe the UK's got its own accounting standard as well. It really depends on what the accounting standards are and then, and then whatever like the CFO um, decides that line, line item should go. This dashboard can adhere to our own, like my, my personal way of how to visualize things. Um, but as long as, um, you know, at the end of the month, what you want to do is you want to get the P&L from the, the CFO and you want to um, match that as closely as possible, not line for line, because, you know, th there's always discrepancies. Like, for example, um, 
revenue can't be realized on a P&L until the orders have been dispatched from the warehouse. Whereas um, uh, in, in this dashboard, you know, revenue is realized whenever there's a transaction in Shopify. So, so you know, of course, if there's a massive sale at the end of the month, like, you know, the whole Black Friday, where some inventory might be kept back due to just how busy 3PLs are, there'll be a massive difference between like November um, in, in like this dashboard and what, what the what the PL says, but then that revenue will probably be realized in the December of a PL. So you have to like marry the two and be like, all right, so what's what's what? Um, but but in general, um, you, you just want to align them as closely as possible in order to be able to give like um, uh, give like an accurate as possible uh, real time view of like what net profit is is for, for any day. So come back to net profit. So you just have an extra column here. Um, you know, net profit doesn't vary too much. So let's say, you know, your, your OPEX expense is like, I don't know, like 5,000, let's say like $10,000 a day, for example. Um, so, so in, so in the dashboard, like in the, in the data source that I use, you just like, you know, okay. So net OPEX cost is like $10,000 a day. You, you just integrate it. Um, and they add another column and it's like, all right, we'll take $10,000 per day from like contribution margin. And then like you have the net profit is like uh, contribution margin less the OPEX cost. And that's like your, what you visualize in there. Now, um, some, some, some like founders are a bit more, um, well, this is just reset, um, must be the four hour auto refresh. Um, some founders are a bit more um, protective as to what they want the team to see. Some, some founders don't like their um, team to see how much like net profit they're making, which, you know, is understandable. Other founders just say, you can view it as a percentage. Um, that's fine. Other founders are like, all right, let's let's have a separate dashboard for like the 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 C team, and then like a separate dashboard for like the marketing team. And so the marketing team can just see like uh, what they need to hear, and not not be um not see the profit numbers. Or some founders are like, yeah, just show everything. I want to be as transparent as, as possible. So um yeah, and so we have the daily that rolls up into last week. Um, so how do we go from this week versus last week? Are we doing better? Are we doing worse? And then we have the week over week here, which is just um, uh, how are we going week over week? Are we getting better? Are we, are we performing worse? What does that look like? And the benefit here is you don't have to like click on, you don't have to toggle the time ranges. You don't have to like click on, um, you know, oh, let's be last week. Oh, okay. So what, okay. What happened five weeks ago? Oh, okay. What happened last month and how did that compare to the previous month? It's just, it's just all here and you just scroll up. You know, you want to answer a business question, you just scroll up and have a look. Um, uh, so, so I, I prefer to view this in in this way, where where you have the 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 date columns are like as as the rows, and then and then the data as part of the as part of the columns. Do you um, have year whereas, over year as well? For me, year over year would be uh, super beneficial. I, I imagine because yeah. week over yeah, week. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not that um, it, it's not viewed here currently, but uh, I mean, yeah, it, it depends on how much historical data you've got, right? Your business may have been around for a year. You know, I, I would encourage people to upload as much historical data as reasonably possible. Most of this data is um, the, the, the biggest the biggest issue, uh, the biggest challenge that a lot of um, brands have that I work with is is correctly passing through uh, cost of delivery data. So that's how, how I like to pass that through is COGS um, plus uh, any merchant fees, um, delivery fees. Uh, Etc. And anything that's associated with getting the order, um, you know, from from the manufacturer to the customer, is how I view um, cost of delivery. And do do you keep um, that so, inside so biggest, your contribution margin, or do you keep that? Do you so, add that after so, your contribution margin? So that's before contribution margin. So 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 you have um, uh, gross sales. So this is part of the funnel, right? You have gross sales. Um, there's a discount and there's return. You got taxes. Then you got net sales. And then you have um, another column here, which it just isn't visualized, um, but 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 it exists um, in like the the, the the Google sheet I have. Um, it is like what, what is the what, what is um, uh, cogs? Um, and so you just minus um, the cogs from net sales and, and or cost of delivery from net sales, and then you get your gross profit. Um, and so so how I view um, so 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 in Shopify, if you're using Shopify. Uh, there is in the in the product um, in, in the product data. There's a there's a field there called cost 
cost per item, I'm pretty sure it's called. Um, and what you do is um, you can either do this via API or you can you, you can already have it um, as part of your uh, like third party um, like uh, software that you use for your inventory. Um, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, you, you can calculate it that way. Um, or, or, or someone can like manually enter in there. I, I don't I, I don't know. Um, we when I was at the UDI, uh, we had like a guy who who would specialize in passing through the cost per item data um, for all the items uh, into the the their respective cost per item or their respective product. And he would just um, every every like month he would 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 meet together as a team. So me like a data analyst. Uh, me and me the CMO there, our data analyst, uh, like a finance director, and, and like this um, API guy. Um, I don't know what his actual title was. was we we'll call him API guy. Um, I'm sure he had a much fancier title than that. Um, and and he he would be like, okay, what is the PN, what what's like the um, what is like the the gross margin on like the PNL? What 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 cog, what's the cost of cogs that we're seeing in the PNL? Uh, all right, uh, you know, maybe we got some invoices through from some team, uh, some 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 three PL somewhere. Um, uh, you know, d does that how does that match with the cost per item data that we're passing through to Shopify? Do we need to update how the cost per item data is calculated and pass that through to Shopify? Um, and and then we're just trying to once again trying to we're trying to keep through the the um the P and L as um. As, as as like close as possible to this scorecard. So so um, you know when we're choosing to scale or like up or down, um, you know depending on how, on how our net profit or contribution numbers are looking any given day or week, uh, we, we're confident in the decisions we're making. So 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 this aims to be like a real time PNL um, as closely as it can be without the specific accounting standards uh, that you know your CFO might adhere to. Um, it's probably more accurate anyway, for or more deployable as as information than the PNL would be anyway, because it, yeah, you've still got all the information you might want to need to make a pretty good decision there. Yeah, um, the and, biggest problem with the PNL is, is you get um, CFOs who who are too like too ingrained in in the way that they're being taught within their own accounting standards. And, and um, you know, which is fine. That's why they're hired as a CFO. You know, they're hired to be diligent and to ensure that, you know, there's there's free cash flow, there's money in the bank. Um, you know, that that's really what, what they're hired for. Um, but, but you know, the, the P&L doesn't necessarily help execute the day-to-day -day, um, with, with, with the marketers in the team. And so this acts like a, a, a proxy to how the, the P&L is, is going to develop at the end of the month. And the P&L cycle is too long. You know, if you're, if you're a good CFO, Within the first week of, of a new month, you've you've got your PL together and then you're presenting it to the management board, um, or like you know the exec team, whoever might be involved in that, and um, you know that, that so so now we've got forty days already, or, or like thirty seven days, uh, thirty eight days um, from like the start of the month to like the first week of the new month until you can see how your marketing activities went from the start of the month is ridiculous. So you need some, you need some decision-making proxy, um, uh, to like, um, be, like reflect what the PNL might end up as, as closely as possible. Now it's not perfect, but, um, as closely as possible as you can be. So you can be confident in the decisions that, that you're making without, you know, getting to the end of the month, getting a new PL and going, oh, holy shit, we weren't even profitable this month. What happened? What's going on? What changes mm -hmm. do we need to make? Okay, let's make some changes. And then hopefully in 40 days, we'll find out if those changes that we made um, uh, made us profitable again. That's ridiculous. You need to you need to be making real-time decisions on profitability uh, every single day. And if you're not, I'd argue, um, you, know, you, you know, you probably should be. Yeah. And you could you could extend this out to include incredibly niche, right, but almost it's almost limitless the amount of information you could or wish to include. Would you ever or have you ever included things like cash conversion cycles or cash on hand percentages in in this? Not this specifically. Um, I don't think it's useful for day to day decision making. I think it's more of a CFO. Um, it, it's more of something the CFO and CEO should be aware of. 
Um, and, and one thing that we we did at Udi was we had, we had a whole heap of different dashboards. You know, we had dashboards, customer service. Um, we had like another management dashboard that, that includes some some more detailed numbers of this. But but um, the point is is this um, this this uh, the data infrastructure that, that I've created and used allows for flexibility to create uh, whatever whatever columns you want to add as long as you know the calculation. This dashboard just works like Excel. Um, you you like correct your times a column, you divide a column by another column. It just it works exactly the same way. So as long as you've got the data in the back end, it can be like pushed forward and represented um, in, in like really any way you want it to. I imported uh, a bulk import of products into Shopify and I did not put in the meta fields the created date and uh, that sent the whole filtering system haywire because you could no longer filter by collect filter collections by newest in first uh, or, or date added to the website, which was a really big problem for this quite large fashion brand. If I didn't have Rewind, that would have been a complete pickle. It would have taken hours, if not days, to sort out all of the while these products are live and really messing up their merchandising. A mistake by me, absolutely. But fortunately, I had the foresight to install Rewind before I made any of these changes, and I was able to just click a button, restore the site back to a previous version just a few minutes before I made that fatal error, and no one was any the wiser. That's the value of Rewind. That's just one use case, okay? One use case. There are hundreds of other use cases. Have it on there because when you need it, you'll text me or you'll tweet me and say, thank you so much, Finn, for recommending that I install Rewind. You saved my bacon. Back to today's show. So you've got the data, but the data without the, the underlying strategy is almost meaningless, isn't it? And that strategy is going to change business to business, although widely you might say that the industry is following a similar strategy. But but generally speaking, that company is going to have to make a decision about short-term profitability, long-term profitability, cash flow, all of those good things. And that's going to change by season, by month, by week, and all those good things. So, I mean, coming into this with your dashboard, how do you... How would you prioritize different metrics or what would you be looking at depending on, or, or maybe give us some of the common strategies that people tend to use this data to, to understand better if it's, you know, we want to grow yeah, at sure. all costs or we want to be really profitable. Can you just maybe pick out a few strategies and pick out a few metrics that would help them understand those strategies, their effectiveness? Yeah, absolutely. So um, up, up, up above the month over month here, we've also got these um, like charts as well, because, you know, not everyone likes to, read data like this um some people like to be more visual and and see so here we've got net sales and gross margin um weekly um and, and see you know it, and and then daily so we say okay how how is you know gross margin looking um a bit up and down depending on discounts or, or whatever products being might being prioritized or merchandised so we need to be aware of that um and, and then the media buyers really rely on this um net sales and then we are um, you know, I like to give work with media buyers and give them a range, like, you know, 20 to 25 percent, 30 to 35, uh, sorry, 25 to 30 percent, for example. Like, as long as we're in this range and, and um, we're good, as long as like a new customer acquisition um, spend, it, uh, sorry, sales is going up and we're spending and, and we're scaling. So, like, okay, like this is healthy, but also, you know, MERs in range um, and, and our gross margin. Uh, is like pretty um, like stable. Um, uh, how is this translating to contribution margin? Is that contribution margin being hit? So even though even though you know MER might be you know might be creeping up a bit, um, how's that affecting contribution margin? Are, are we better off spending um, less money at like a um, lower MER um, and and banking like higher contribution margin than we are at spending um, more money? I want to go into that because uh, that is a really, yeah. sorry to pause you there. I, want to, I do want to go into that in a bit more detail because that is a quite a debated topic at the moment where I think a lot of companies, are, a lot of CMOs, a lot of marketers are focused on MER, really hyper-focused on MER um, and AMER. And there is an argument to say that actually, for some of the reasons you just mentioned, contribution margin is a better metric because, like you said, you could be spending more efficiently, but ultimately getting a uh, well acquiring less customers but ultimately netting out a worse contribution margin than if you actually spend a slightly reduced mer uh and vice versa as well so can you just explain that argument and, and which way you would take it if it was if it was up to you yeah well um 
it's it's never it's it's never usually up to me. It's it's you it's up to the founder, and it's like okay, well, what you know, it starts for it start for me. It really starts from what is the founder's goals? <clears throat> is it to is it is it to like scale as fast as possible to show like top line growth while you know maintaining uh you know ten percent profitability um. And, and and that the, 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 they're consciously making the decision to be less profitable because they want to invest more of you know invest more in growth and so so they're consciously making that decision. maybe that's strategic because they want to um, you know grow really fast and show you know strong growth into the into like a potential acquisition or, or flip side maybe they want to um, be growing um, reasonably well um, uh, and sacrifice growth to show. Um, like like you know, twenty to twenty five, thirty percent net profit margin, and, and and even though they're not growing as quick, you know their 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 net profit um, percentage is is like really high, a lot higher than you know ten percent. So it it really starts off with like what what is the founder's goals and what are they comfortable with, and then you know I would help um you know the uh, they'll talk through that with myself. You know, I, I, you know, one of the first things I like to do when I work with brands is build this dashboard from scratch for them. It takes me um, about five business days um, to, to do. And, and, and I bring up this data from them and I go, okay, so here's how things are going. Some, some people don't really have their books in order um, um, and, and they're amazed by just having something like this. Or so some people are like, oh, yeah, this is actually really close to our PML. Um, and, and it's great. I can see this daily rather than waiting like, like a 40 days for it. Um, and so uh, it, it really depends on the founder, what their goals are. Um, if, if their goals are to stay profitable, then that's great. We'll bring up the net profit percentage column and, be, and, and it'll be, okay, you know, okay, media buying team. Um, at, at one of our main goals is to uh, maintain throughout the month uh, like a minimum of like 20%, um, you know, 25%, let's say, net profit. That's, that's our main goal. And, and so... Um, you know, assuming the OPEX doesn't change too much, we've got our calculations right, um, uh, and assuming these calculations are, are correct, then we can see every day: are we hitting our target? Um, is is net profit within target? And if, if it is, great, like we're, we're doing our job. Um, if it's not in target, if it's too high, we're too efficient. Um, you know, the founders communicated to me: oh, we're trying to aim for a percentage of you know, net profit percentage twenty five percent, and we're doing thirty five percent. You know, we 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 need to consider. Okay, what levers do we need to pull to, um, uh, like, uh, make the trade off, which is uh, spending more on on new customer acquisition, um, and therefore like a higher MER, which means you know hopefully high amount of you know net sales. Um, uh, but what that means is you know contribution margin will will, will take. Here, it just means we're spending let, let less efficiently, I guess you could say, uh, but but we're showing revenue growth, okay? And so so it's always a trade-off, and that's why I like to view this in a funnel because you know when when you do something, you know you you're running some CRO experiments, you you have a discount, you know discounts why they might um, uh, decrease your your gross margin. Um, maybe what happened like percentage, what happens as a result of that is maybe the the number of units people buy goes up, and so the average quantity goes up. Uh, and AOV doesn't actually change because all the changes is people just buy more things, um, uh, but but just at a bit of a discount to price. Um, so, so so there's all these things that happen uh, in like in like the system, and, and that's why I like to view this is within like the context of a system. So like you, so founders like we we have a net profit target of twenty five percent. I'm like okay, so what are the levers that we need to work with within the system, and how do they interact? With each other, um, that allows us to like a hit our like net um, net sales targets um, and hit our net profit targets. What what are what are the things in the system that need to tweak and change uh, over time for us to be able to achieve that? And and then this is like the the dashboard that that I've found personally and people I've worked with um, to really help monitor the the success of those changes you are in the D2C space, if you have a brand that's selling online and you haven't at least had a demo with Sendlane, then one of two things is objectively true about you. You like setting money on fire, you like making your life more difficult. 
if neither of those things are true and you are an e-commerce brand and you are selling online, you do send emails, you do send SMS, you do have reviews or at least like to collect reviews, then there is no reason for you not to at least have had a demonstration with Sendlane. They are built for e-commerce. They are the most modern platform with the best features, in my opinion, at the lowest cost. I mean, I'm not really sure what would be holding you back. Please go and check them out. Show notes below, they have an event coming up. You can still get tickets, I believe, for that event in San Diego. A link to the Commerce Roundtable in the show notes below as well. Please do go and check out Zenland if you haven't already. Back to the episode. Talk us through again how to read the uh, the graphs that you've created, the more visual displays of this data. And uh, there was one particular moment where I was, you were talking about channel uh, deployment and things yeah. like that, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. So, so here we have at the top, you know, um, uh, let's say, let's say, for example, you know, founder has a, a net profit target, you know, you, you work your way backwards and go, okay, well, what is the contribution margin target that would need to hit, hit that? Um, and maybe it's 2.4 mil for the month of November. And so now, now we track like, you know, um, the target contribution margin versus like the result. Are we on track? Are we off track? How are we doing? Um, and so every day the team looks and go, okay, we're, we're under track or on track um, in, in this you know, hypothetical example. Then we have here, we have like platform spend. So here we, here we have, um, you know, three channels, for example, you got Meta, you got TikTok, you got Google Ads, and you can see, okay, what's the breakdown of spend between those, platform, between those platforms as like a, the total value? And what is the percentage breakdown between those platforms? Because here, if, if you're just looking at this for a moment, um, and you're not taking into account the, um, the 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 percentage. You can't really tell, like, okay, is is Meta is Google scaling with Meta? What's going on here? And so I like to view b- both charts always as total um, uh, and and percentage of total. So so maybe you start to see um, Meta start creeping up and become like 50, 60, 70 percent of total spend. And then and then maybe as a result of that, you're looking down here at MER and MER's gone from like 25 to 35 percent as well. And you're like, ah. Oh, Okay, so like as we started to spend more on like Meta, what also happened on like the 23rd of November, for example, what also happened is that MER went up um, because uh, actually Meta is really showing us diminishing returns. And so, so, it, so once again, you're like, okay, what's going on um, uh, on the daily? How does that translate into like the system of like, uh, of like what, what numbers we're tracking here? And then do we need to make changes based upon the inputs to get our desired output? So the input change would be, all right, well, we need to scale down meta to be more in line with what it was previously. Um, and we make that decision. We look at the numbers. We go, okay, yep, it looks like we're back on track. That was a good decision. Um, so that's one hypothetical example with the platform spend. Then, then the channel spend is just, you know, within meta, you have several uh, channels within meta. You have Instagram spend. You have Facebook, you have the audience network, and then you have um, this unknown. This is all exported from the API via Supermetrics. So this is just how Supermetrics or Meta defines their own breakdown. Just before we jump into that one, sorry, just going to take you on a small tangent on that last point. Um, I want to understand a bit better your perspective, your opinion on daily changes, weekly changes, monthly changes, yearly changes, strategy changes, deployment changes. Um, So when you're looking at that, and you like that example you gave where you saw the MBR creeping up and perhaps that was to do with Facebook spending more, less efficiently, maybe we need to make a change. It sounded like you were implying maybe that would be like a, a, a change that you'd make in a 24 hour period and then reassess the next day or the following day, which yeah, you'd absolutely. definitely be able to do. Yeah. Um, so so you, you are a believer in that kind of level of incrementality of like a, a daily tweak, a daily change, a daily tweak, a day, really staying on top of it rather than letting thing play, things play out and reviewing or maybe on month by month or like how, how, what's your mentality going into this and, and, and why do you have that mentality is I guess what I'm trying to understand. Yeah. I mean, the teams that I, I work with, with this approach, um, uh, I, I, I looking at, you know, these, these dashboards and seeing like, Okay, well, you know, you know, we made some changes yesterday, or we made some changes a few days ago, and they're looking at like, you know, it, this dashboard is really useful because because it allows people to see the, the the context of their changes within the business and not their channel, and so channel managers sometimes get too caught up in like what is the what is their specific platform saying, 
and and uh, they need to be more aware of the effects of their changes on the on on, on the business. And so, if you're if, if you're making changes as a media buyer um, a few days ago, and, and there were some big changes, like you uploaded some new as some new assets or a new offer, um, or or you you're changing um, you know you're changing your budgets. You want to be able to check what is the business outcome of your changes, not with, not just within the platform, but on the business. Because I, I, at the end of the day, is the is the business outcomes that we really want, not not the specific um, platform, uh, you know, performance metrics. Is is the business outcome and that? And that's one of the things that I think this dashboard allows to do. It just provides context on the business outcome for people's changes. Um, and so I, I, I encourage everyone who I work with, especially media buyers um, and anyone in the performance marketing team, to, to look at this daily and it's part of like their workflow of things I might do. So media buyer, you know, wakes up in the morning, you know, they check their accounts, you know, how's ROAS today or, or you know, how, how are the new creative tests that we launches, how should we spend, et cetera. Um, and so this just gives more business context of like, okay, um, we increased budget, we uploaded some new assets, we, we deployed a new offer. Uh, look at all these metrics that have seemed to have changed. Um, people are, um, you know, the people have up taken the new offer because uh, conversion rates higher, a lot higher than it was the other day. Um, the offer was a bit more discounted, but that's okay. We're seeing discounts flow through pretty effectively. MER has decreased because the conversion rates increased um, and therefore our budgets were able to spend a lot more, but also, our contribution margin uh, is is a lot stronger than it was um, because um, you know a lot more you know our conversion rate increased because the offer was so good so great let's let's up our budgets again let's spend more um, so I, I'm not a fan of the let's let's wait for a month and see what happens like like you need to um, you, your, the team needs to be agile enough to understand when things aren't working and and when is a reasonable amount of time to accept things aren't working and then and then make changes, but also accept when things are working and then double down on things that are working and have the feedback loop to like, um, uh, like make the changes necessary to, to do more of what's working. That might be spend more um, or, or um, you know, translate the offer into other channels that, that, that's working really well that will hopefully the next day start to see that, et cetera. And so, so it just provides really fast feedback loops to be able to identify. Um, I, I agree. Fundamentally, I agree. I think if your team is on it enough to be reviewing and actioning this data daily and doing so effectively, you don't have to pay as close because the enemy of this is macroeconomic factors or consumer behavior, things that you can't control, but will influence your data yep. outside of the things that you are manipulating that give you a false result in your head about what's actually happening. But the counter to that is in this sense, in this case, if you are in there every day, it doesn't matter if a macroeconomic factor affects the results because the next day you will make a change, regardless of whether you know what that factor is or not, that will combat whatever is happening and ultimately you net out at roughly the right place anyway, rather than sitting down and thinking about you know, whatever might have happened to consumer in the last 24 hours and trying to work that out and then trying to retrospectively yeah. counteract that. If you're doing this every day effectively, then then it doesn't matter because you will end up in the same place. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And 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 I'm I'm not like advocating. Oh, everyone needs to be making changes every day. That's that's not the message I want to get across. It's more so trying to provide trying to provide um, the the right data um, to to show what is the business outcome when big changes are made, and to be able to either identify things that are not working really quickly, like an error or rogue discount coupon or some um you know scout or, or some diminishing return spend um or you know versus um you know having to wait for like a few cycles to, to be able to identify that it's, it's just it's just really um the the ability to diagnose and, and provide fast feedback loops um um yeah that's really the, the, the aim and i suppose uh, and actually just to advocate on this one of the comments on your thread which by now hopefully most people have seen it was from either a previous or an existing paid 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 marketing paid media performance guy i think maybe at one of the companies you used to work at advocating for how helpful this was in his day-to-day oh -day uh, yeah marin wonderful yeah. media buyer shout out to marina inspire brands 
Yeah. Um, and obviously, I can see there you've got lots of really interesting things, post-purchase post survey data there by channel broken down. And all of this is just painting a picture. Uh, but it's only as good, I suppose, as the data coming in and the plugs you have piped in to power this. So talk to me about data integrity. And generally speaking, in this day and age, we've got these tools, like you said, like, like Shopify and things that should have and maintain your data fairly well, as long as you're keeping it up to date. But generally speaking, do you see that brands have got 80, 90% of the way there with the data that they're plugging into this, or do you have to do some work often to actually get the data accurate before it hits your dashboard? Yeah, like, like I mentioned before, the, the, the biggest variable that um, I need to work, everything takes care of itself. The only thing that I usually need to work with brands uh, with um, and I'm usually not the best person to help them do this. I usually work with their finance team or the CFO, or I, you know, bring bring in someone who can help them do this. Um, is how they calculate cogs or, or cost of delivery, how they calculate cost of delivery, and how they push that um, dollar amount uh, into the cost per item field in Shopify, which you can then, you know, create a custom report, export that data, and and then that's how. This dashboard is creative, so so that that that's the biggest variable, um, because it's not like you can fake spend in Facebook, you know. It's like you got to tell Facebook, oh, I need like this is how you calculate spend Facebook. No, Facebook's like, here's how much you spent yesterday. Um, Google's like, here's how much you spent yesterday. So you can just use super metrics to, um, uh, like their ETL tool, uh, to export um the different account spend data, um, and and that that that's the easy bit, um. You can't fake account spend. Um, uh, and, and then, of course, all, all the Shopify data, sessions, add the cart, conversion rate, orders, AV, you know, gross sales, discounts, you know, th this is all Shopify. So you can't really fake that data unless you're, you know, processing your own orders. But, you know, there's ways to exclude that data from this. But th but um, it's just two, two custom Shopify exports I've created, um, session reports um, and a, um, a sales report. Um, and, and like I said, the only thing that needs to be, the only thing that needs to, um, be worked on, if at all, uh, is how cost of delivery is calculated and that pushed through into the cost per item field of one, all the different product variants. And once that's all done, is this working off an API? Is it automatically refreshing and updating or are you still having to do like manual yeah. uploads? So, so, so let's assume best case that everything that I've mentioned is done. Um, and and then so so this is um a customer report that I create the infrastructure is Clipbolio, um it's it's a it's a um, data visualization tool and um I, I got a guy who I use um I, I don't actually know how to create any of these formulas um he helps me out um based in the Ukraine I've been working with him since 2019 to build these dashboards um and and uh so so he works with me I, I give him the data so. Uh, this operates on Google Sheets um, as like the data warehouse. So I don't know how to, you know, AWS or, or you know, anything like that. I've got no idea how to operate. Um, I'm pretty good at Google Sheets in Excel. Um, so all the data that I that, that I um, export uh, just goes straight into Google Sheets, you know, use a Supermetrics connector, um, export uh, some custom Shopify spreadsheets, and then just like marry all the data together. And then um, I go, um, and then, and then that data gets referenced um, in, in this data visualization platform, and and that that's it. Like like I've got a template. Um, I've got I've got a data structure template. I know the custom report templates I need to create in Shopify. Um, you know, Supermetrics. You just export the spend, um, and and then you just align it so it it, it all the data um, it, it is represented in a way um, that is easy to to to, to export. Uh, or import into into Clipfolio, and and then there's some other third party data sources. Like here, we've got a North Beam, or you, you know you can use whatever attribution tool you want, Triple Whale, etc. And and so this is just a manual CSV export. So export the CSV, um, upload, um, you know, copy and paste the data into my Google Sheet, um, and uh, you know, st structure it a way that makes sense to be to be visualized like this. And um, then you have this post-purchase survey here as well, um, you know, fairing or, or um, no commerce, um, export the CSV, copy and paste the data, um, put it in the, in the Google sheet and visualize and in, in, in a structure that 
uh, allows it to be visualized like this. And you can toggle these on and off as well. So you can, you know, how much, you know, how successful are these? So you can, you can, you can toggle these on and off as well to better understand the correlation between, between things. So, you know, let's say we want to understand how successful these Clavier emails are here in, in the, the teal here. We can like um, toggle this down and see, okay, does it look like when we're sending an email, it's having an effect on some other channels? Um, you, you know, you can toggle the clavier here. You go, okay, well, um, it, it might, you know, looks like it's having an effect because some other, um, you know, uh, demand capture channels seems to be increasing like organic, um, Google organic or, or, you know, Google ads are increasing, which, which, which signals that maybe more people are searching our brand after that email. Um, and, you know, you can correlate, correlate it with, with how the different spend. So how much are we spending on, um, on YouTube every day. So you just disconnect everything. There you go. That's a YouTube spend. Um, and so um, you can go, okay, so this is what we're spending on YouTube every day. Interesting. Um, uh, our survey respondents are um, responding between like 20 and 25% of that they found our brand or first heard about our brand via YouTube. But on the attribution platform, it's only like 10% that they're saying they heard about us. So um, if, so actually the, the spend, um, how much we're spending as a percentage of total spend is correlating pretty well with survey respondents of their first purchase. Um, but actually, uh, North Beam is under-reporting us. So maybe, maybe in this, um, and there's a reason for that, North Beam doesn't take into account um, view for YouTube for memory uh, and some uh, other reasons uh, as well. But um. Um, you know, in this regard, you know, our post-purchase survey data is kind of, you know, lining up with our, our channel um, spend data. So so may, maybe we're, we're, we, we should scale YouTube because but here um, it's underreporting how well it's doing. So maybe we should consider spending more. So decision, so insight, decision. All right, let's see what happens if we spend more on YouTube, maintaining other, other spend flat. So let's say we start increasing YouTube and then we see like, okay, actually new customer percentage of sales is actually going up from like 85 to 90 percent wow youtube is actually a pretty good source of like new customer revenue and, and our mer is like maintaining stable uh and the other channel spend is pretty stable okay great youtube spend looks like it's working pretty well let's let's increase youtube spend Let, let's invest some more money into this so once again it just provides like a few a, a few res a few data points um to, to, to like um triangulate between like what's north been doing what's post-purchase survey doing what are we spending? Um, how's the MER and how's that? How, how is it translating to like this funnel of metrics that, that we should be looking at um, uh, on the health of our business? Beautifully done, sir. I think we've covered most of it there. I think I've got the gist, mostly, uh, of everything <laughs> you're you. doing there. It's a fantastic tool for any business. Um, you can definitely see why people on Twitter found it so insightful and exciting. I'm glad that you're able to share it here. So should a listener wish to know more, uh, then one, I've done a terrible job here today. But if you do wish to know more, where and how can they reach out to you and what sort of is involved in uh, getting this set up? Can it work for any business or is there a certain size that this is sort of more pointed at? Yeah, thanks, Finn. You absolutely haven't done a job. You've been very thorough in the questions you've asked and, and most of the questions I, I get from you know founders or performance marketing teams all the time. So thanks for reaching out. I really appreciate it, and I really love sharing this uh, with with everyone. I've, I've kind of kept it close to me for so long, um, and now now uh, you know uh, now I need to um, I, I want to help people. Um, you know I, I, I've been a big uh, beneficiary from DTC Twitter for many years, and I've always been like a content consumer, never really a content creator. And, you know, part of that is of transition from being always being in-house um, at, at brands to to now being a fractional CMO. Where now now I'm actually helping brands. So, so part of the transition for me is like, okay, well, I've got to show people some things I can help them with. Um, and part of that is like, okay, well, here's this thing that I think is best in class um, and I think can really help people. Um, here's what it is. Um, and people can find me at Tyson uh, Twitter. Um, so my handle is Tyson Drake. Um, and people can send me a DM. It, it, it's it, in my view, it's best for eight to nine figure brands. Um, and the reason that is is because 
um, uh, it, it's part of the service that is part of my fractional CMO service. It, it, number one is like me integrating this dashboard and then working with, uh, you know, your brands, your founders to like execute, um, like, like tr train, like the, the media buying team and the house team, like how to think through this and, and how to, how to work with it. And, and that, you know, takes, you know, a bit of time, you know, a few weeks to a month or so to train it, et cetera. But it only takes about a week to, to, to um, implement. Um, although after the, after that tweet, I've got a ton of inbounds. I've got so many inbounds. Everyone's like, how can we get this? How can we get this? Um, can you integrate this for me? And, and so, um, you know, I, 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 I thought through it and uh i do want to help other people do it like like i don't want to provide i don't i don't want it to be like hey i'm just going to integrate dashboards with people you know that like that's something that um uh, i've decided i can offer as like you know a side i guess a side project um for people if, if they want it um just just dm me uh and you know if i feel like this dashboard is suitable for you and your team um i'd be more than happy to chat but you know, you're going to need your own infrastructure. You're going to need to pay for Supermetrics. I think it's maybe uh, 500 to 1000 dollars a year, um, depending on how many data sources you want. You're going to need to pay for Clipfolio, which is maybe 150 to 200 dollars a month, um, uh, and uh, you're going to need someone to maintain it as well because it probably has a 15, 10, 15 minutes of maintenance per day once it's set up. So, so um, I would I'll tell you what, people. though. There's a yeah. business there, isn't there? You just need to record 10 how-to training videos, send them out, get someone to maintain 20 accounts, and then get someone to onboard people and set this up for them. Some budding entrepreneur listening to this, I'm sure, slide into your DMs and offer some kind of... <laughs> yeah, or well, someone, <laughs> someone next week has already done this and, and, and they've done it. Hey, I mean, you know, may, maybe there is and maybe that's something I need to, to consider um, uh, whether, whether I want to do that at all. I mean, I'm still new to doing my own thing i've always wanted to do my own thing um and now i guess i'm in the fortunate position where where, where i am and i can um and, and so yeah maybe this is something that i need to consider um but if it's this. not this if it's not this you want to do fractional cmo work right so uh what companies are you looking for if you have pick of the bunch uh pick of the listener if you like and uh, you know where do you fit best? Who do you fit best? Geographically, size, market. Is there any determining factors for you that you're like, this is a great fit for me? Yeah, uh, usually eight to nine figure brands are the best fit, and the reason that is is for a few reasons. One is I've usually got like an existing team in place that um, needs some, you know, needs, needs some better leadership or, or needs some uh, like frameworks or. Um, need some, uh, you know, more account accountability, or um, um, you know, maybe maybe the founder is is doing dual roles, which is usually the case. You're usually run, running performance marketing teams, managing doing you know OKRs, trying to help the team scale and, and you, know, you know provide them, you know, their their their, their knowledge of, of how to do that. Um, so so usually, if anything my my main one of the main things i do is just remove the founders from doing the day-to-day -day work um uh, or run, running the meetings you know the, the founders can go on and, and focus on more strategic things like uh you know what, what products do we need to introduce in like q2 q3 next year who do i need to hire how to restructure like our three pls or um you know which countries are we going to internationalize so those are things that you know really strategy things that, that founders should be thinking about rather than like um, what's AMER target? Like, like the founders shouldn't be really thinking about those sorts of things in the daily. So if anything, um, I just, I, I help remove founders from the day-to-day -day operational um, cycle um, and um, allow them to free up their mental capacity to work on the, on the business and strategy. And then I would come in um, and then, you know, provide frameworks for the team, like a framework, for example, like we talked through how to use this dashboard to help make decision-making. So that's like a framework um, and then and then kind of train the frameworks to the team and then help them like um, help them use that framework and then just keep them keep them accountable. Um, you know, some clients will do OKRs, quarterly OKRs of like what, what, are the, what, what are the team targets that we need to hit, how to think through that and then provide OKR reviews. Um, so, you know, some um, brands identify gaps in their business. You know, maybe they, you know, they, they need to hire um, 
an analyst or, or maybe they need to hire like an e-com manager because e-com managers managed by several people in the company. They just need, you know, don't step out um, far enough to, to, to think about what they need. Um, I've had a lot of experience through uh, eight and nine figure brands and, and uh, even some seven, seven figure brands. Um, but what I, what I think is where I can provide most value is in the eight and nine figure, because that's when a lot of the challenges start to arise with team structure and scaling and, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, start to arise where I think uh, I can provide the most value. And, and that's usually where the founders start to transition away and focus more on strategy um, versus operationally doing all the work as well. So I just think it's the best, um, I, think it's the, I think it's the best fit. I think having a fractional CMO for a seven-figure brand is just too early. Like, it's, it's just too early. You probably want, like, either an agency managing everything um, or you want, like, a good generalist, a good media buyer generalist, um, or, or, or a good performance market generalist, uh, you know, growth person, just doing everything. Um, and you just don't need my ex, ex, like my expertise either. Um, so, so, and I don't think charging me charging um, what I would charge would be fair to those brands either. So the eight and, figure, eight and nine figure range, I think is best fit for me as well. And how do you find it doing it remote? What's your counter to uh, doing it remote? I imagine you work in. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all, all of my, um, all my clients are remote, to be honest. All my clients are international. I don't have, I don't have a single Australian client. Um, uh, you know, I don't know why that is. Um, uh, people who have reached out to me or I've connected with them in the past, um, I've just all been international. Um, it's got someone in Europe, um, someone, in, someone in the US as well. Um, and so they are... Yeah, it, I mean, it just is what it is, right? I mean, I don't, I don't discriminate. <laughs> I'm not here to go like, oh no, I don't really like you, Poms. Um, I'm gonna, you know, be annoyed about the rugby or something. I don't want to, don't want to help you out. Yeah. I mean, whoever, whoever just like wants some, some help, um, uh, is like who, who, who I help. Um, I like to um prioritize people based upon uh, best fit for me as well. So, so first is like, are you are you making enough money to like cover, like reasonably cover my, my, um, my services? I don't, I don't want to take anyone for granted. Um, do you have, do you have, um, do you have the challenges, uh, in your company where I think I can help you or, um, you know, you just kind of, um, contact me cause you just need some advice. You know, I, I do 15 minute calls all the time where people are just like, oh, you know, we, we talk through what my role will be. You know, I give some advice. I'm like, listen, you don't need me. Um, just like hire this person or, or, or you know, think about things this way and, and, you know, go, you know, come speak with me in like six months or a year or something. You don't need me now. So I turn people away all the time just because I don't think they're at the right stage or, or, or if it's the right fit. But when it is, um, you know, I, I, I want to work with people long term and provide value. I think... Um, if you're not providing value, you get found out. You get find out pretty quickly, especially with your viable. scorecard. You'd see your your uh, your cost straight on there, and then you'd see how that's transitioning out. So you sort of you got to get it right because uh, yeah, no. But yeah. even even me as like a, as like a, a fractional CMO, like if I am not performing well for my clients, mm. um, I would you know I'm sure I'd be called out. But I'm sure people would people would. Um, that's one of the reasons why you need that that net profit column activated if you ask me yeah yeah include yeah uh, yeah so, yeah so i i, I agree <laughs> so so this is just just an example in 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 some clients i do um yeah. some clients i don't this is just a like example data it's a template um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. next time i show some of this i'll chuck the net profit column on there as, well, i think you're right some people are guarded about it i've never understood why i think transparency is brilliant in a business and can't lead to anything but yeah i get it i get why you weren't and do it anyway listen sir it's been a fantastic pleasure to have all of this time i'm actually going to put this as a two-parter i think for people um yeah just because you stuck uh, around for this long um you yeah. won a prize thank you uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah we'll do uh, something for yeah. you i'll get you some discounts from the operators uh guys and um you can you can use those and i'll i'll put them in the in the thing below um <laughs> yeah all right mate well look that is an immense amount of value, especially for people that you'd be surprised the people I not necessarily have on the show, but are in, I come into contact with who are just at such a basic level with any of this, this would blow their minds. I don't even think that this level of 
vision into data and what that can produce they believe is possible but it really is and it's very attainable like you said within well less than a month a few days i think maybe a week or two you could have yeah i mean i mean that's the goal right of like if i if i i mean if i had this when i started back in like 2008 2009 i think it would have i mean i know it would have really benefited the business that i worked for so if, if this benefits you um you know Take it, implement it in your business, and, and I hope you I hope you success. I, I succeed. I really do. There's like millions of brands out there. I only take on like two or three clients at a time. Um, you know, I can't help. I can't work with everyone, but take this and implement your brand. And if you want me to implement it for you, I'm more than happy to. Um, send me a DM, Tyson Drake, on Twitter, and yeah, I really wish everyone hell of a name best. by the way, Tyson Drake. That's a serious. You get some points for that name. That's power. Um, <laughs> I, I, we're going to be calling the e-commerce API of uh, ChatGPT, Tyson Drake. I can almost see this. You've got 80% of the components you need to create a AI CMO. You just need the outputs tuning. I, I think it's doable. I think you could be the guy with the billion pound <laughs> commerce API that, that plugs into ChatGPT and and creates this fractional digital CMO. I don't know. Who knows where we go? Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's 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 a it's a comp it's a it's a really complex role. It covers everything from like leadership to merchandising to like strategy to data analytics to growth growth to like um, you know you have to know about you know opex and contribution margin and you know, you have to know about so many different variables, value, you know, positioning, value proposition, brand, creative strategy. Um, it, it's such a complex role. And, um, you know, that's one of the big benefits I get out of Twitter is um, trying to follow the right people who, who I look up to within their respective field and just take a little bit of like, oh, that's an interesting way to think about something. I'll, 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 I'll see how that fits within my mental model of, of how that works. Or, or, or just validating, yep, that's how I think about this thing. These are how, these are the conversations that these people are having about these things. Yep, my, my mental model on this subject is, is like validated um, as much as I, as I can validate mm. it without. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to see you go, go against Statista or I think Common Thread, Taylor's got Statista, hasn't he? His kind of uh, proprietary data analytics tool status that's it the teeth yeah. is a bit continental yes yeah, so it? is like a third party uh <laughs> data platform but yes statless um yeah so, so i mean taylor's got a great strategy there like offers you know status for him is uh giving um like offering or oh, i think they charge for it but um you know part of part of their their agency service is is, is to um have statless and then that's a value add for their for their clients but also they get this massive data on on like the health of their brand and they can use that to I guess better help their clients as much as they can you know provide some benchmarks across the industry like i've seen his like ltv benchmarks there um and, and so yeah i think i think taylor and the ctc um uh you know people there uh provide a lot of value for the in the, for the industry um yeah a lot of respect for, for taylor and what he's built there all right sir we're done all right, that's the end of part two of the Tyson Show uh, on the Ecom Gold podcast brought to you by Sendlane and Rewind. If you haven't already, go follow Tyson on Twitter. I've got a feeling we're going to see some incredible stuff come out of his account as he starts to turn on his personal branding and content machine. Hope you enjoyed this two-part series. If you have any questions for me or Tyson, you know where to find us. Otherwise, we'll see you next week with another episode of Ecom Gold. <laughs>